Uh, yes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining this webinar today. Uh, warm, warm welcomes to all of you. Uh, we are glad to host this webinar on behalf of the DFS Working Group and the Alliance for Financial Management Unit, and we we'll welcome you all. Uh, first of all, I would like to take a moment to recognize uh, joining us today uh, is the Deputy Executive Director for AFI, uh, Mr. Norbert Mumba. Uh, welcome, Mumba. Welcome, Mr. Mumba. Uh, we would also like to recognize uh, the presence of the Board Director, Central Bank of Haiti, uh, Mr. Judy. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we would also say a big thank you uh, to our host today, the Chair of the DFS Working Group, Assistant Sub-Governor, uh, Ihab Nasser from the Central Bank of Egypt. Thank you for hosting this event and welcoming us to, to this wonderful webinar. Uh, before going forward, uh, special recognitions to our colleagues joining us from, from the Asian area uh, for staying up this late and uh, for our colleagues also joining us from the Pacific. Uh, we recognize that Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Solomon Island, uh, you're staying up quite late uh, to join us at this hour. We appreciate your, your sacrifice and commitment and welcome you to the webinar. Uh, without much ado, uh, it promises to be an exciting evening and we hope you enjoy yourselves as we discuss and share ideas on this new topic and relevant topic, uh, central bank digital currencies and the influence on financial inclusion. Uh, taking us further into this meeting and to get us started, I would like to welcome the Deputy Executive Director Mr. Norbert Mumba from the Alliance for Financial Inclusion for the opening remarks. Uh, the floor is yours, Norbert. Oh. Um, thank you very much, um, Adiemi, um, and thank you very much, uh, colleagues, uh, for this um, very important uh, seminar, um, webinar, rather. Let me start um, by ac acknowledging um, the presence of our, uh, our speakers uh, tonight. Um, tonight from Kuala Lumpur, you'll excuse me, and different times of the day from uh, all over the world. Um, again, uh, Professor Anna, uh, Bobby, Anka, Raj, and uh, Professor Ol 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 Olajika, uh, West, David West, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are really uh, delighted that you could join us and to assist us to provide more insight on this uh, uh, important uh, topic. And um, to colleagues from uh, the Affin Network, uh, greetings and a warm welcome to uh, everyone. I hope you are safe and in good health as you join us for yet another interesting uh, webinar. Uh, this is the last, as you may uh, be aware, of the virtual webinars for the working groups for 2020. And at this point, it's really important for me to express um, our appreciation for your support and commitment that uh, ensured AFI meets its objectives as near as possible uh, in this challenging year of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Your ability to uh, adapt to the virtual modality has underscored the importance of AFI's, AFI as a policy leadership uh, alliance and also has enabled the network to offer the much needed uh, timely policy responses to members in times of crisis. Once again, thank you, uh, everyone. Turning to 2020, uh, we all uh, are we all agree that 2020 presented unprecedented challenges with many uncharted paths, but the systematic, effective, and coordinated policy responses from members, uh, from you members that was shared via the AFI COVID-19 uh, dashboard helped us to unravel unique opportunities of innovation, resilience, and provided also a lifeline to many uh, sectors and segments of our communities, particularly women, informal sector, micro, small, and medium enterprises. So as we continue uh, to navigate the crisis, 
we see that technology is central to resilience and recovery. And we must strive to sustain the high rates of adoption and usage of digital and financial services post COVID-19 and seize new uh, technology-based opportunities. In this regard, trends suggest financial regulators are increasingly prioritizing the study and experimentation of central bank digital currencies or CBDCs as uh, abbreviated. This is a new form of central bank issued and digitized, uh, digitized sovereign or fiat currency, probably as a path to modernize their payment and financial system, all to prepare for the anticipated global digital economy. Rising attention on CBDCs supports the position of the Digital Financial Services Working Group during the 19th Working Group meeting, which was held in the Bahamas in March 2019, that CBDCs should be taken up and explored by the Working Group, especially from the perspective of its relevance and linkages to financial inclusion. It is extremely important that we, uh, we uh, test uh, this relevance and that we research into the possible linkages that uh, 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 or the possible benefits that this can bring to financial inclusion. This priority has been emphasized repeatedly in subsequent working group meetings and finally unanimously adopted to be taken forward by the members at the recently concluded 22nd Digital Financial Services Working Group management virtual meetings in, in October. Recent research as well, uh, findings, reports that 40% of emerging and developing market economies, re which represents a sizable proportion portion of, our, of the AFI network, have concluded experiments on central bank digital currency, with approximately 10% at various uh, pilot stages. This obviously translates to a significant interest of financial regulators to examine the motivations, the implications to monetary policy, financial system integrity and stability, consumer protection, and particularly to linkages to financial inclusion. In this light, we seek to draw actionable insights within an inclusive, sustainable, and secure financial system context. And in this regard, I therefore suggest that you consider to explore the following to guide your discussions today. Firstly, it is often said, the best way to solve a problem is to put it in the right context and properly define it. We should therefore focus attention on defining and discussing the evolution, design, use cases, and opportunities for central bank issued digital currencies. Focusing specifically within the context of an inclusive and sustainable digital future for the 1.7 billion currently excluded. Secondly, inherent in every new technology is the spectrum of potential cascading risk. My charge, therefore, is that the deliberations today be funneled through the lens of mitigating risks, abate direct, indirect, immediate, possible, and, and or probable to the institutions that we represent, and also to the financial and payment systems we supervise and the people that we protect. Lastly, I believe we have a consensus that quality and sustained financial inclusion and even the immediate recovery from the global emergency will, be, will continue to be influenced by technology. Therefore, our readiness as financial regulators to enable and support innovation at scale must maintain high priority on our agendas. Specifically, we must evaluate the uniqueness of our individual country context, institutional culture, capabilities, 
resources, immediate to long-term strategies and goals, the market, the consumer behavior, and much more to determine reliably our position, approach, and actions going forward. Dear colleagues, as we begin to appreciate and draw insights from the plenary and workshop today, I encourage all of you to apply a strong relevance to financial inclusion. Filter as we consider ways to harness innovative regulatory approach, approaches and technology. As we step out of our ideation stages, we should take forward solutions that are fit for purpose, adapted and relevant to a sovereign context and designed to address present issues around access, usage, and quality of financial services, sustain the financial health of vulnerable groups, including women, youth, and the elderly, and also enhanced supervision, consumer protection, and market conduct. Finally, allow me to conclude by reiterating that this webinar should be a starting point in taking these ideas and conversations forward and should provide a solid foundation for stronger collaboration between regulators, market actors, other stakeholders, and also ensuring readiness to take forward the modernization of their financial and payment systems and in participation with an inclusive global digital economy. As we are coming to the end of uh, the year and this being our last webinar, I wish you fruitful a fruitful meeting and season greetings and thank you to all of you. Thank you very much and back to you at the end. Uh, at this juncture, I would like to introduce the moderator for today's webinar, uh, Professor Olayika David West. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yemi, and good afternoon and welcome everyone. I think it's quite exciting to be here to be not only hosting the last webinar for the DFS Working Group, but also talking about a very contemporary and topical um, topic that is a that is uh, on the minds of a lot of uh, financial regulators. I welcome all the AFI members and colleagues to this event. And I want to start by just saying, can we just get a feel for what is going on in the room? I think Mr. Mumba has set the pace for the conversations we're going to be having today. So I won't repeat that. We'll look at what's the ecosystem, what are the use cases, what are the regulatory and uh, challenges, especially as they relate to financial inclusion, looking at readiness, and also how do we prepare ourselves to ensure that we can actually abate the risks and actually take on these um, CBDCs, like 40% of the community have already started. So Yemi, can we launch the poll now? And in this poll, we'll be asking three very simple questions. And the questions really are about your own state of readiness, the second one is the potential of CBDCs to um, ac accelerate financial inclusion. And then the third is about your in-country actions. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in taking the poll. We'll just set aside two or three minutes for this. Thank you. So we, see, we can see the poll. Questions one and two. Do you think central banks and financial regulators should consider or pursue potential opportunities, if any, that central bank digital currencies present? That's the first question. And the second question reads, do you think central bank digital currency will accelerate financial inclusion in your country? And then if you scroll, there's a third question as well. What actions has your institution or the financial regulator in your country taken with regards to CBDCs? And this is a multiple answer question, so please select as many as you want. Thank you. Thank you. Can we share the results, please? Okay, great. So we can see that in the room here, Wow, 77% of us think that CBDCs have a role to play and potential opportunities for financial inclusion. No, that we're considering CBDCs and we should consider the opportunities. 
49% think they will have a role to play in financial inclusion, although 44 are sort of like a maybe. And um, so basically only 7% say no, that they wouldn't have leveraged financial inclusion. And there's a lot of activity going on at the moment. So some of us are doing exploratory studies or research. Some of us are evaluating options, established. Some of us have established a position. Some of us are at pilot stage, and then some of us have actually gone live. And then some of us are not doing anything at all, which is fair. So hopefully by the end of this conversation, you'd have more information on what to do and how to go about doing that. Thank you all very much for your participation. We really appreciate your inputs and your contributions. So today we're going to have this uh, panel discussion in three sections. The first is going to be presentations by our panelists and discussants. And then in the second stage, we'll have a panel discussion and a round table with the, with the four discussants. And then we'll open it up to the floor for Q&A. But recall, you can also put your questions in the Q&A future so we can have them as we go along. And our first speaker is going to be Professor Douglas Arner. He's the Kerry Holdings Professor in Law at the Hong Kong University. So we welcome Professor Arner. And he's going to sort of set the stage and the theme for the total discussion as well. Then we're going to have contributions from Bobby Chen. He's the Assistant Manager eSolutions from the Central Bank of Bahamas. And for those of you who joined early, Bobby was the one that provided the Sun Dollar video showing how the use cases of how to use their Sun Dollar um, product in the Bahamas. And then we also have Raj Dahamodran. He's the EVP Digital Asset Products at MasterCard. And then last but not the least, we have Angarusu. She's the Head of Partnership Policy and Advocacy at C-Lab or Cello. So welcome, pan distinguished speakers and panelists. It's a pleasure to have you here. So I'll hand over now to Professor Arna for his own theme setting presentation. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Olinka. And uh, thanks to, to Norbert uh, and uh, Adeyemi and, and the committee for the invitation to, to be here. Uh, it's been a pretty incredible year. I was one of the, the first speakers uh, at AFI at the beginning of the year, and I was probably uh, in one of the last groups live, and I think I was in um, one of the first uh, Zoom sessions when we were turning uh, to COVID issues. And uh, we've had lots of discussions, and uh, some of you uh, may have joined an earlier discussion on uh, central bank digital currencies. And so, um, next slide, please. What uh, I want to talk about, and a couple of uh, background papers in case you find them useful. Next slide, please. Uh, I think when we're looking at central bank digital currencies, there are a number of things to keep in mind. And I think what has really been incredible over the past two years has been how quickly uh, discussions have moved ahead. Um, this is something that if we think of uh, a BIS survey that was released at the beginning of 2019, very different positions. Of course, one of the big things that changed in 2019 was the release by Facebook uh, of the Libra proposal. And that dramatically uh, accelerated many of the discussions going on. So we see uh, a similar BIS survey released at the beginning of, of this year, which very much uh, highlights a, a, a massive sort of increase uh, in interest over the topic. And I think one thing that then pushed it forward has been uh, the launch or the announcement of the planned launch and pilot testing uh, in particular of uh, DCEP in China, the digital currency electronic payment system. And that uh, as potentially the first major economy, major currency CBDC is something that because the rest of the world would have to be dealing with it almost in some way uh, has pushed things forward yet again. But what I really think has pushed things forward the final stage has been COVID-19. And uh, I think it's something that if I compare, say, CBDC events discussions uh, in January or February of this year, post Libra, post DCEP launch um, versus uh, 
since March. Uh, it's been a pretty um, dramatic change in the context of interest. And, you know, the real background to all of this is a long term technological evolution. And so one can think of uh, essentially money, finance, technology being co developmental. Uh, and in many ways, money reflects the technological horizon of its time. We think of early settled civilizations, think of coins, think of metallurgy. That was technology in parallel with money. We can think of uh, the development of, of early negotiable instruments uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Middle East, uh, in the Middle Ages. We can think of the advent uh, of bills of exchange in the 19th century. We can think of the telegraph, uh, the advent of early electronic payments and a dramatic acceleration across the last century, the launch of the ATM uh, in 1967, uh, followed soon thereafter by SWIFT, a range of RTGS systems developing into electronic payments. Uh, and finally, uh, in 2009, the launch of Bitcoin. And I think what that highlights is a long term technological evolution, but really the speed over the past decade in particular has dramatically increased and it's dramatically increased not only from the decentralized context discussions of distributed ledger technology and blockchain, but also from the standpoint of centralized technologies. And of course, yesterday in China was Singles Day, November 11th, uh, and we've set yet another record of more tens and tens of billions of dollars of online transactions in a single day. And that is a centralized electronic payment system. So the revolution that we've seen in terms of technology has not just been decentralized. It has, if anything, been more from the standpoint of centralized technologies. And I think it's interesting because if we look at Bitcoin, yeah, Bitcoin was launched as a direct challenger to fiat monies in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. And many central banks began studying the potential implications of Bitcoin and DLT five, six, seven years ago. Why? Because when we're thinking about central banks, one of the central functions of central banks is in the context uh, of monetary stability, money and monetary stability as a public good combined in most cases with financial stability. And in many cases where those two objectives come together is in the context of payment systems. And central banks around the world have taken on a leading role in, in many cases, running, administering payment systems, or at the very least, supervising and monitoring payment systems. Because a payment system is the blood of an economy. If there is no payment, the blood doesn't flow, the economy doesn't function. And of course, we've seen this in the growth of mobile payments, RTGS systems, as well as DLT systems. And the end result is that central banks have a long familiarity with technology in money and payment. From the monetary standpoint, one of our biggest challenges is always fraud and counterfeiting. And so central banks are continually focused on anti-fraud, anti-counterfeiting technologies on one side and electronic payments on the other. And so a continual need to be up to date because as existing systems reach the end of their life, there is a need to explore what are the potential technologies and systems that may replace those systems. Uh, next slide, please. And I think if we look at COVID-19, we've really seen it accelerating pre-existing trends. Uh, if we think of the last decade, uh, technology, the global financial crisis, regulation, these were probably our big trends. Going forward, technology, but technology very different. And I think Libra launch highlighted something, and that is that technology is a much more powerful tool than we had thought of before. And I think one thing that is very interesting and important for our discussion today is that core to the Libra proposal was or is financial inclusion. Now, there has been a lot of skepticism around the seriousness of that intent, 
but there has been almost no skepticism about the viability of technology and the importance of the objective. And I think what Libra has done in many cases is it has accelerated discussions around this thinking. And one example of this has occurred in the context of the G20 uh, roadmap on electronic payments, which is a direct reaction to the possibilities of technology and in the context of, of financial inclusion. So COVID-19 has accelerated digitization. It's dramatically increased digital payments. Next slide, please. But it's also, as we begin to, to move a bit forward, we're thinking about not only how do we deal with this crisis, but in terms of the resources that we're spending, how do we put in place better infrastructure going forward? And I think when we look at central banks, we see a, a variety of, of core functions. And we have to think of the central banking system we have, independent central banks with fiat currencies acting as lender of last resorts, monitors and supervisors, this is a form of technology. And as the technological horizon changes, central banking needs to change as well. Next slide, please. And I think when we are thinking about this context of central bank digital currencies, Really, the starting point, and I think Norbert highlighted this very well, is to look at the situation in your own country or region. What is working well? What is not working well? What is there? What is missing? And to think from that evaluation of what are the objectives? What is it that you are trying to achieve? And clearly, our discussions today are focused on financial inclusion. And once you've set your situation, once you've thought through your objective, then you think about the options. And the thing about central bank digital currencies is we're still at quite an early stage and there are lots of different models and options. There are systems that are purely monetary systems. There are systems that are purely payment systems. There are combinations. There are ones that are purely public, very few that are purely private, uh, others, and a variety of structures token-based systems, account-based systems, centralized, decentralized, retail, wholesale, domestic, foreign, what sort of interoperability with other forms of money? Is it replacing cash? Is the objective to go cashless or is it to deal with people who otherwise can't access cash, governance, liabilities, finance, final, finality? From the developing country standpoint, but really from every country standpoint, core is security. If you are building a technological platform that is the basis of your monetary system as one of the most important public goods provided by an institutional arrangement in an economy, security is paramount. And that means that you need to understand both who is designing it, your own capacity, and the risks that you are bringing in, as well as the problems you are trying to solve. Privacy. Privacy is a design feature in a central bank digital currency. Do you want it? Do you not want it? And there's a huge spectrum of different design options. And in particular, and I think this is one of the most important from a financial inclusion standpoint, what's your international or regional context? How can you build interoperability, at least in a region, if not more internationally? And so once we move from those design options, and remember, the technology, you are not limited to blockchain. In fact, most systems we're seeing so far are a variety of centralized structures, some using distributed ledger systems, others not. Um, but it doesn't have to be a blockchain-based system. There are a variety of structures. That then takes you into thinking through the design, the technology, capabilities, capacities, and risks. Next slide. I'm just going to mention a couple of points because um, most of the examples, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, the discussion from, from Bobby on the new sand dollar proposal. I think this is extremely exciting, but I wanna highlight a couple of points from some of the others. Um, we look at DCEP in China. One of its objectives is very much around financial inclusion. Why? Well, think about it for a second. Yeah, China has been one of the star performers from the standpoint of financial inclusion and digital finance, but it still has one of the largest 
populations that are unbacked, a couple of hundred million people. So in the context of China, hey, it's, it's uh, less, it's 10, 15%, but it's a very large number. And what most of these people are is they are in rural areas, often illiterate, often minority languages, very rarely internet access, and often not even mobile phone access. So what you have is you have a group that despite the impressive performance of Alipay, WeChat Pay, remains outside. And so one of the objectives of DCEP is essentially to build an offline wallet that can be used by this group outside of the system. It's also something that can be used across Alipay and WeChat Pay to build interoperability, but that is a different sort of objective. And so we think about DCEP, one of its objectives, one of its important design features is financial inclusion. Another financial inclusion aspect that we don't often think about, in China, as a foreigner, it's almost impossible to do normal things like buy a coffee or hail a taxi without Alipay or WeChat Pay in urban areas. And as a result, if you are imagining Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics, you're getting all these foreigners who have this cash stuff that nobody in Beijing knows what to do with. And so actually your financial inclusion to a certain extent is all of these people who need to be brought into your electronic system, but they can't because they don't have bank accounts, ID cards, or local mobile phone numbers. And so what do you need? You need wallets that allow them to be brought in. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Finally, I'll just highlight similarly from the standpoint of the digital dollar. It's really taken COVID-19 and of course DCEP to push forward some of these discussions. But once again, a central element really is around financial inclusion. The United States has about 10% of the population who are long-term chronic excluded from the financial system. Uh, and this is an area where uh, we have seen some of the efforts around the digital dollar Fed pay system, for instance, or also uh, some wallet based systems are designed to figure out a way to bring in people who are otherwise not in the system. This is something that in the context of COVID-19 response has been seen to be a real weakness of the US financial system. It's actually very difficult to get financial resources to certain parts of the population. And so one aspect of the digital dollar proposals are exactly around this. Next slide. And next slide. So I think just to close, if we are thinking about the individual situation, the big question is what is the situation in your own country? What is missing? What is not working? What are you trying to do? What are the options from a technological standpoint that might help you address those systems? You need to understand your own system. You need to understand the technologies, because if you don't understand the technologies and the providers that are trying to provide those technologies, you are bringing in probably more risks than you are actually potentially gaining from the standpoint of benefits. So from my standpoint, I actually think the potential for many developing countries in this area is huge. And I think the designs are going to be very varied uh, and I think some real opportunities, but I think it's something that has to be looked at very, very carefully. And central bankers, as we all know, tend to take things slowly and carefully. And I think that this is one of those areas that should not be rushed. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Douglas Erna. And I think that you have sort of put us on the cautious side, not to be so hasty in jumping into it, but taking the full picture into consideration. What are our objectives? What do we need to do? What are the design considerations? And then before we look at the technology, because there are many variations of what we can implement as CBDCs. Thank you very much for that. So we'll get going into the conversation. And I'm sure a lot of us are excited to really hear the implementation experience of the Central Bank of Bahamas. And I'll now hand over the floor to Bobby Chen. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, first of all, um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here um, again. And, and uh, I certainly uh, miss all of you 
all of my beautiful friends at AFI um, to be able to see each other face to face, hopefully in the very, very near future. Um, next slide, please. So uh, as, as Professor uh, Douglas had alluded to, we are perhaps living in the most, I'd say the, the greatest economic as well as the greatest technological revolution of all time. And with that comes a very quickly, very swiftly changing payments landscape that's further accelerated, at least in our local context, by a series of black swan events that we had been hit with as a nation over the past, I would say, year and a half. Uh, firstly, it was Hurricane Dorian, which was a mega category, almost category six, if I would put it uh, that way, hurricane that devastated our two of our um, main key family islands. And it practically dislocated um, our access to physical banking infrastructure. And the second um, element is this uh, global uh, health crisis that we're all in the midst of right now. Uh, and that um, effectively renders all in-person transactions as well as any sort of form of contact payments as essentially a health risk, a, a, a biohazard risk. Um, and it's often not, uh, not encouraged, nor is it uh, permitted in some, in some instances. So to, to address, I guess, to answer Professor Douglas's parting question is that um, we are developing the sand dollar out of a necessity. It was bred out of necessity because all of those previously mentioned events culminated to this phenomenon whereby uh, certain financial institutions in, in the more remote parts of, of, of the country is finding it more and more economically infeasible to operate in those thinly um, engaged or thinly interacted locales, which results in leaving a huge gap, a, a huge financial gap, a huge uh, sector of financial exclusion to those family islands. To put into context, uh, when I was in Abaco, one of our family islands, uh, sometime earlier this year, um, we had spoken to, to some of the residents locally, and one, of the, one person had to uh, take a ferry, a 45-minute ferry, and then drive another 30 minutes to get to their nearest um, financial institution so that they're able to withdraw in, into cash um, their month end uh, uh, wage, which to me in my mind is ludicrous because with a recent survey we've uh, recently completed uh, as the central bank, we've discovered that more than 95% of individuals in the Bahamas has access to uh, mobile devices as well as internet. So we are quite advanced and developed technologically um, and which is, which is sort of what prompted to our commitment to continue to modernize our payments infrastructure um, through this project, uh, Sand Dollar. And we are very proud to announce that uh, we had gone nationwide um, on October 20th of this year. And uh, we, we have, I guess, become the first uh, central bank in the world to, to, to issue a uh, retail level central bank digital currency. Um, next slide, please. Um, some of our evolving objectives uh, we can take a look at uh, surrounds the uh, efficiency, surrounds financial inclusion to, to, to garner more cost effectiveness and to establish a non-discriminatory access to um, similarly the availability of cash. This is something that we've stressed and that we've, we've highlighted that we want Sand Dollar to replicate the availability of cash, regardless of your immigra immigration status, residency status, um, economic status. And finally, it is a big part of our regime to strengthen the national defense against AML risks, against counterfeiting, and against other shadow activities that are currently being perpetuated by cash. A noteworthy thing to, to, to recognize is that when we began this project two and a half years ago, we were looked at as um, going against the grain because um, you know, regulators uh, were at the time 
dissented from, from, from really pursuing any aspirations of, of developing CBDCs due to its unfounded benefits as well as its high perceived risk. And now two and a half years later, uh, after a lot of R&D, a lot of uh, trials and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of pilots, we are now lauded as, as, as a, a trailblazer in this regard. And, and now we are developing the policies that other countries are, are seeking to follow suit with, which is something that we're extremely proud of as a small island nation. And that we're hoping that, we're con that this will uh, create a, a, a sort of domino effect for other countries to also uh, model after. Next slide, please. So really high level, what sand dollar represents. It is a digital representation of the Bahamian fiat, meaning we, we often uh, underscore to people that it is no different than the substrates, the physical substrates of currency that is currently being held in your pocket. It is no different. It is just a different representation of it. It is still M0 in the monetary um, uh, supply. It is still represent, uh, uh, represents the, the cash, the banknotes, um, as well as the coins that is in circulation within our ecosystem. Um, it is mobile date based technology, uh, which means that it primarily utilizes QR code technology to interface between applications and devices. And it has very little to no cost and it is non interest bearing, which means that we do not intend for sand dollar to replace or to even, um, you know, you know, try to uh, take away from the depository mechanisms that are currently available on the market today through formalized uh, commercial um, financial institutions. Next slide, please. Um, some of the central strategies we utilize, I won't go too much into detail with each of the components, but um, as you can see, we are utilizing a uh, contactless onboarding mechanism whereby individuals can go download the application on, on their mobile devices and be able to sign up and, and, and perform KYC that way. Um, we do also have some elements of offline capabilities to ensure that there's redundancy and that there is a, a 24 seven availability um, for, for the end users. Um, it is interoperable with other wallet system. It is at the end of the day, uh, programmable money. And as, uh, as Professor uh, Douglas alluded to, it is tokenized, uh, which means that as other global institutions uh, create their own versions of CBDCs, um, there will be a, an eventual interoperability amongst all of the countries that have digitized their sovereign um, currency. And we are also connected to, uh, in, in some regards to the RTGS and into ACH, which allows a seamless sweep in between your wallet your bank account, vice versa, which is something that is important given that this is still a very nascent technology that takes a, a, presumably some time to, to, for individuals to fully adopt. And we are intending to, uh, in the very near future, actually before the end of this year, we're going to um, also release a, a shared EKYC platform whereby we're standardizing the KYC process as well as developing a, a underlying chain that connects all of the uh, various uh, participating institutions um, and their client information so that it can be shared. Uh, an issue here in the Bahamas is that many of the financial institutions have very segmented and fragmented um, user databases. And a lot of the KYC information is not interoperate, that does not interoperate amongst all of the institutions, which is very costly and very time uh, ineffective. Um, so we are developing an underlying infrastructure to connect all of the various nodes to be able to achieve uh, more standardization and interoperability. And we do have a distribution mechanism, which can be seen as a benefit in times like in these unprecedented times um, uh, for easier access to uh, social benefits and, and uh, mass distribution to the public. Next, please. So I'm not going to go too much detail into this, but from left to right, you can see the overall distribution of sand dollar. Central bank is still at the helm of creating and issuing um, sovereign currency. And once that is um, delivered to the approved uh, financial institutions, then they are responsible for onboarding their users. 
Uh, and then the information then funnels into our shared KYC infrastructure, um, very secured uh, regulatory compliance process. And then that get the funds um, made available to the public is then uh, being disseminated through their devices, one of which is a mobile device and another which is a smart card that we also issue for individuals that may not be as technologically savvy or may, may be a bit more technologically averse. And we intend for government agencies as well as utility companies to eventually be able to accept um, a sand dollar as a form of uh, settlement of debt, um, as well as using that to uh, initiate payroll and having mass distribution of sand dollar into the hands of, of consumers through which they can then use to spend on goods and services, make person-to-person -person transfers, uh, pay utility bills, and so on. Next slide, please. So who can use it? Um, right now, the, the three broad categories are businesses, uh, small mom and pop businesses, all the way up to large utility companies, mega hotel resorts, government agencies. Uh, for individual purposes, I, people like you and I, we can transfer um, balances between mobile devices and wallets. And also non-residents, transient visitors that are coming here to visit the Bahamas can also sign up for a sand dollar wallet um, with any of our authorized financial institutions and they'll be able to cash out um, either through ACH um, or they can cash out in fiat in their domestic uh, currency in fiat as well. Next slide, please. So here are the tiers. Um, we, we have right now three operational tiers, one of which is tier one, which requires actually no form of ID, no form of verification. You just have to provide your, your name, uh, some basic information about yourself, a phone number, as well as a, uh, an email address. That allows you to have $500 of holding limit and $1,500 of monthly outgoing transactions, making payments specifically. Um, tier two is, um, is we anticipate that most of the Bahamian residents will reside in this tier because it requires one form of ID to create a wallet. And then with that comes $5,000 of holding limit as well as $10,000 of outgoing transactions. For tier three, it's reserved for more businesses and as well as higher net worth individuals that may have a need to transact in such high amount. And that requires enhanced uh, KYC, uh, enhanced due diligence, um, providing the commensurate uh, documentations to, to allow for such. So and then it is assessed by a case by case basis. Next slide, please. So as you can see, th this is uh, what's shown on the screen is, is our sand dollar reference application created by central bank. But we do have mobile wallet providers out there that have their own proprietary um, product and service offerings that may differ a bit um, than, than the screens um, that, that, that are shown in front of you. But essentially, you can use it on a mobile application, uh, on a, a mobile device such as an Android smartphone, a tablet, and as well as a smart POS terminal, which uh, is a more industrialized um, a device that can allow EMV chip reading capability, swipe capability, as well as scanning QR codes. So that's something that I, I, I foresee being used in, in a, you know, a larger um, corporations as well as uh, as well as larger uh, service um, uh, service industries and then there's also the portable QR code the portable QR reader as well <clears throat> next slide please from a security perspective I want to preface that we do have a, a blanket um, a very stringent blanket ISO certified, um, assessment that, that we require all of our participants, all of the participating AFIs, um, uh, um, approved uh, financial institutions to undergo before they are admitted into our platform. Um, and the system by itself is block all by default and we offer permissioned access for, for um, financial institutions to, to join, to participate. Uh, three of the, the specific factors that we, we, we we assess um, at, a, at an application as well as a, a ecosystem level is the multi-factor authentication, which allows users to, to verify their, their identity. Um, and secondly, the wallets are highly encrypted and they are layered as well for maximi ma maximized protection against um, intrusions 
as well as uh, any fraudulent activities. Um, and then the thirdly is the cybersecurity assessment, which has been um, has been imposed to to all of the financial institutions um, from a software level, from an operational level, from their application level, and from any sort of API interface um, areas that we 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 um, we I guess uh, the, the sand dollar system is exposed to. So um, these are some of the security measures that we've undertaken to ensure that the system is um, healthy. Some of the benefits um, are one of which is to reduce the, the carbon footprint of printing uh, cash. And it, it, it does drastically reduce the likelihood of loss as well as any type of criminal activities um, that are being perpetuated by physically uh, by cash. Um, it is merchant lower fees, uh, low, lower merchant fees than other electronic payments. And it does promote faster settlement um, instant settlements rather. So there is no T plus one, T plus two um, as with traditional wires and bank transfers. And it does allow a fully auditable transactional trail, um, but it, it is also very cognizant of um, user, user privacy as well as uh, user confidentiality as well, meaning that the information being uh, transferred amongst um, the, the participants are all encrypted and they are only view, viewable and accessible by designated individuals and approved individuals. Next, please. So for the Sand Dollar pilot, um, it was launched officially um, back in December 2019 um, in Exuma. And uh, we, we actually had a great amount of uh, interest. We, had, we originally anticipated only about maybe 500 users, but we ended up having about 1,200 um, individuals signed up to receive a wallet. So that's something that's uh, tremendous and it shows that there is a, an appetite for, uh, for this type of um, innovation and this type of service in the, in the more remote family islands. And in Abaco, the same way, after individuals were devastated by the storm, um, they were left with nowhere to, to really, uh, to, to safeguard their, their funds as well as to be able to send money to and from their family resident, uh, their family and relatives in, in, in um, other parts of the country. Uh, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we were unable to, um, I guess, um, fully enrich the process, to fully enrich the, the pilot experience, uh, because a lot of the physical on the ground promotions, um, sort of the, the training um, could not really be uh, facilitated during, during, during the past few months. So, uh, so uh, right now, hopefully, in the coming months, we're going to be more engaged with the public and be able to truly test out and tr truly see the benefits of sand dollar um, in the very near future. Next, please. Um, yes, as I mentioned before, um, the sand, do sand dollar can be used to support uh, social and economic uh, means to, to further promote uh, financial inclusion. Uh, we, we are in talks with uh, some government agencies to, to use sand dollar as a form of their uh, um, social benefits to dis disseminate social benefits, as well as for individuals to be able to pay um, their their utilities and and pay for their government uh, service fees directly through sand dollar. So this is something that we're actively working on, and hopefully in the coming months we'll be able to give a, a more detailed update on the collaborations. Next slide, please. Um, looking forward, um, you know we we are looking to ultimately improve. The level of financial inclusion for for this country hopefully um all users in the bahamas will have unequivocal and evil, even access to a more modernized payment to a, to, a, to a more cost effective payment and a safer uh payment through by through which they can use to manage uh, their their family expenditures be able to um perhaps um invigorate the use of e-commerce for entrepreneurs to be able to accept payments directly on their social media platforms online and their mobile devices. Um, so this is something that we're gearing towards and we're hoping that uh, Sand Dollar is, is going to be the cornerstone for all future uh, FinTech innovations to encourage uh, entrepreneurs to think outside the box and to see the opportunities that exist uh, with, with this uh, CBDC initiative. Uh, next, please. Uh, yeah, in conclusion, I think uh, this pandemic really underscores the need for us to be resilient, to have an agile payment infrastructure to meet the needs of the people. And we are committed 
uh, on this agenda for the long haul. Uh, we also do um, want to foster an environment where there are no impediments uh, to spur economic growth and to, to encourage everyone um, in the Bahamas to continuously use sand dollars as a supplement to the current um, offerings that are available to them and to continue to progress forward as a nation. Um, so with that being said, thank you so much for, for your time and uh, looking forward to any questions that you, may, you guys may have um, at, the, at the conclusion of this uh, seminar or webinar. Thank you, Bobby. And Yemi, we're going to play the video. Like Great. Bahamas introduces sand dollar, the digital Bahamian dollar. Here's everything you need to know to begin using sand dollar today. When you get cash, you keep it safe in your wallet. Just like cash, sand dollar lives in a wallet too, a digital wallet. You can access your wallet using the sand dollar app or the sand dollar card. For this demonstration, we will use the generic sand dollar app. The look and feel of each sand dollar enabled app will vary based on the financial service provider. Getting started with the sand dollar app is simple. First, you need to enroll with any authorized financial institution. You can find a list on our website or social media pages. If you have a smartphone, first download the app from the Google Play or Apple Store, open the app and click Get Started. Follow the simple set of instructions and off you go. There are three ways to send and receive sand dollars using the app. The first way to send sand dollars is to scan the recipient's QR code. Here's how to do it. Open the app, confirm your identity using the four digit code you made during setup or using biometrics by scanning your face or fingerprint, hit send you can now scan the recipient's printed or on-screen QR code. If your recipient is also using the app, make sure they hit the receive button on their device. Enter the amount you want to send. Hit the authenticate and send button. Confirm your identity using biometrics or by re-entering your four-digit device code and you're set. Transaction complete. Hit return to wallet to see your updated balance and the transaction confirmation. Okay, thank you very much, Bobby, and thank you all for the questions. So as you can see, we're sort of evolving through the conversation around CBDCs. We had Professor Anna just give us the theme and uh, the theme, and then Bobby, who is currently in it, has now given us what they've been doing as a central bank and their two pilots. And I think what's interesting is the fact that they're, they're two and a half years into the journey and they're still just about to go live with the full product in general. So before we continue and take all the questions and we can see that there's more questions coming in for Bobby about the process, the details, the fees, the KYC. But before we go through any of those, let's now get the perspective from a technology platform viewpoint, because one of the things we've started to talk about is the technology and the evolutions of the, of the technologies in general. And I'm glad that we have with us uh, today, Raj da Damod Damodharan from MasterCard, and he's going to be sharing with us some of the concepts that they're building out in the MasterCard labs. Thank you, Raj, over to you. Uh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. And it's wonderful to be on the panel. Uh, it's great to see the efforts on CBDC taking off around the world. And uh, I'm delighted to see the Sand Dollar project um, take off in such a meaningful way. So what I wanted to share, if we can go to the, the, the next slide, please, the next one. Um, what I wanted to share today is really um, our view on how we are thinking about central bank digital currencies. Um, if you're wondering why MasterCard is um, is having a view here, we operate a variety of networks around the world. Obviously, you know the card network uh, um, around the world. We also happen to uh, operate a a B2B business-to-business -business network as well as an account-to-account -account network in a number of countries. And um, so we, uh, in any um, central bank digital currency launched, uh, will come to market 
as you saw from the previous presentation in that context. So we wanted to offer a little bit of our point of view on where it is and how we can be helpful in experimenting variety of features that uh, Professor Douglas talked about earlier as well in terms of how to balance account versus token privacy and how interoperability works and so forth. So I'll start off with sharing a couple of viewpoints and what are the key elements that we think are important um, that central banks and, and private parties around the world should consider and we'll go into a little bit of what we do about it and how we can help in this process. So the first one, um, I'll actually start at the bottom. All of, all of you know um, that whatever the uh, policy objectives are, whether it is for monetary reasons or for efficiency reasons or financial inclusion reasons, whatever your policy objectives that drives a central bank to launch a digital currency, end of the day, it, it got to be used and it need to be you, uh, very consumer or business or merchant centric. It, it really need to, put those features, um, I would actually think from outside in, in terms of how the currency is designed and uh, how what the privacy attributes are, how accessible the currency is, how it works with the rest of the uh, rest of the world out there as a starting point, as a consumer centricity is, we think is quite important. All the systems that we launched and use cases that we launched from contactless payments to online payments uh, scaled really well because wherever we solved consumer, problems and the simplicity is where it took off. So, so I would start there in terms of any system design attributes and features and so on, and the security and trust of consumers, again, equally important. So we, if I were to move up one layer, if that's what we want to achieve, then the best way to achieve is to make sure that the system works with um, everything that's out there today, uh, as well as adding new features, um, for example, uh, the, there is there is merchant payments in, uh, accepted today around the world using a variety of mechanisms. Can we make sure that these currencies interoperates with it, um, being able to work um, in that context, if you will? Um, simply, for example, you know, can you make the currency work in a simple contactless terminal that's already there, or a a chip terminal that already may be in, um, in many of the merchant locations. So how do we do that? It should be a consideration that, that if, we, if we take care of that, then we are taking care of the consumer centricity as well. And, and then the next layer really is, how do you, um, you know, central banks are responsible for minting and distribution of currency in general. And obviously here, you know, you would take that role as well. But beyond that, how do you actually launch a plat uh, an innovation, a competition for uh, multiple commercial uh, applications and services to be built on top of this dollar? Um, people talked about programmability, people talked about configurability and how this uh, digital, currency has uh, is built on new technology that is more open so i would i would really encourage us to think about how we can keep the currency open and accessible through all the other uh, mechanisms so that private parties can build applications and services on top and um, more uh, more platforms built on top of a core infrastructure of minting and distribution really unleashes innovation and end of the day uh, as you look at the cbdc there is also other payment system modernization projects that many of you are undertaking, whether it is moving to faster ACH or upgrading your RTGS systems. Uh, I would really um, think about in that context of how you could achieve some of those objectives using CBD as, as, as one of the toolboxes um, as, as opposed to looking at it as a monolith or a separate system, because it needs to live um, in order to deliver the consumer value prop in, to, in order to uh, for you to achieve the monetary objectives, it really need to live in the context of existing systems. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. So talking a little bit more about the interoperability itself. When I talk about interoperability, what we really mean, I think Professor Douglas uh, talked about this as well. Um, we are talking about a CBDC that's accessible through existing value transfer mechanisms that are out there, whether that's B2B or B2C, person-to-person -person payments, merchant payments, uh, and, and interbank money movement. It, it's really what we are talking about is making sure that the, the currency is accessible um, while 
there may be a minting and distribution system, the currency should be accessible to all the messaging system. If it is designed that way, and obviously there are new standards that need to evolve in terms of how uh, the money moves between a, um, a, a CBDC network that is designed to move the money with the message uh, and along with uh, the messaging systems that are already out there. Uh, I think these are early stages and we wanna be helpful in this process in terms of figuring out how we achieve this um, in a way that doesn't um, significantly increase cost for every participant in the ecosystem, which has been a, a core um, objective of ours. So, so what we decided to do, if you can move to the uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, um, you may have seen some of, uh, um, some of the press a few weeks ago. Uh, what, we are, what we are launching here uh, is a virtual test platform to help um, central banks around the world to experiment with the various aspects of it. This is not meant to be a commercial system initially. It is meant to be a, a test platform that allows um, a central bank to think about the variety of uh, design choices that we've debated here and discussed here early on. Um, what level of privacy should be there, how we support offline payments, how the system should interact with the rest of the world out there, whatever your current uh, systems are, um, what use cases should, you should enable, and how you get other licensed entities to participate in this process, whether that is commercial banks or um, other licensed entities that you may allow uh, people to operate wallets to. Should you actually distribute directly to the consumers or should you go through a multi-tier system to distribute? So all of these require different configurations of the system. It has pros and cons. So what we decided to put together is MasterCard has been investing in blockchain and digital asset technologies for a number of years. So we are able to do this to get quickly to put together the technologies required in a virtual platform that we would work with a central bank and other participants directly to configure and to see the trade-offs between one and the other. That's really the point of this. Um, and then ultimately it will inform your design choices. It will inform how you would want to eventually launch this platform. Um, uh, so that's really the idea behind it. And uh, our um, overall advisory services um, that we have that helps you go through that journey from thinking through the pilot scoping and how you want to um, roll it out over time. So all of this is, is, is really to say that, um, uh, you know, 14 percent or so central banks are looking at various stages of it. And these policy decisions have far reaching um, uh, implications as you know very well. And um, I, would, I would really recommend like other panelists recommended taking a thoughtful deliberate approach and, and thinking through what the implications of each one are and how it can come in the context of your payment system that's out there already. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, some of the, the features that we talked about, I think I've talked through many of them already and happy to take any questions that you have. Um, it goes through some of the details of, of, of this. Uh, anyway, um, in the end, what we want to offer really is, um, is, is um, uh, our time to think through and uh, and happy to meet with any of the central bankers out there to share more details on this point of view and and really work and collaboration with governments around the world uh, to figure out what the right strategy should be but also help you through our virtual test platform uh, a way to um, uh, a way to arrive at the right design uh, happy to take any questions now or later however you choose to do it Okay, great. Thank you very much, Raj. We'll take questions later, but I think um, I, I have a quick one that might be on the minds of uh, the center of the audience now. In terms of the onboarding onto this innovation platform, what is the what are the requirements on the process so they can just have a, a, a brief idea? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, we, I think, reach out to us, and I'm happy to share contact info offline. Um, every situation is quite unique. This is set up in such a way that each central bank can uh, get their own environment to, to work through. And often um, the trade-offs that we talked about require us to configure the systems. So we're happy to work with individual um, uh, banks on this and uh, uh, feel free to reach out offline. We can go into more details um, on okay. how, how we can uh, help, help you. 
Okay, great. So again, I think that you're emphasizing the fact that it's not a cookie cutter approach and it has to be systematically designed for each of the objectives. Great. Thank you very much, Bob and Raj. So at this stage, we're going to have Anka Rusu. She's from Celo, and she'll give us some perspectives from the consumer side, because again, we've looked at the general themes of in terms of what CBDCs are. We've talked about it from the regulatory perspective and an implementation instance that we see in Bahamas. We've looked at the technology platforms, understanding some of the considerations. And now let's go to Anchor because Anchor privacy is one of the key issues that we have been hearing through the day. So let's uh, hear your consumer perspectives from the, uh, from the cello perspective. Thank you, Anka. Thank you so much for, for the intro. And I'll make sure to go quick because uh, I'm aware that I'm standing, the last person standing in between um, the audience and, and the panel questions. Um, great, if we can go to the next slide. I'm uh, painfully aware that we are neither MasterCard nor the Central Bank of Bahamas. So I'll give a quick overview of what Celo is just for the audience. Um, and Celo is an open blockchain platform that aims to make financial tools accessible to anyone with a mobile phone. The team underwent over two years of extensive research in emerging markets from Philippines, Tanzania, Colombia, Kenya, Sierra Leone, um, to build, uh, to, to inform um, the features of a platform um, that is mobile first. Um, I will highlight a couple of the features because I think they will become, um, they'll be interesting to have in mind when I start talking about the use cases. Um, so first we have the Solo. Um, we've taken a full stack approach to so building both the platform, which is open, um, open protocol that is able to run smart contracts. And then on top of that, we have the set of smart contracts that comprise much of the logic of the features of the platform, including stable currencies, um, identity attestations, the ability to link the phone number to the blockchain public key, thus creating a unique identity for every user on the chain um, and governance. Um, one of the core contracts that we have is a stability protocol that is a mix of algorithmic and seniorage that's capable of hosting, hosting uh, an ecology of stable value currencies regional currencies and community currencies. Um, and you, I'll talk about one of the examples later. And then last but not least, what we also wanted to do is really design with the users. Um, and so we have built um, as, as a first example of, um, of applications that are very easy to interact with, a wallet um, that we have shared with, with our partners and we have tested on um, I think it was Sierra Leone uh, where the team was to do a focus group and we tested it on a $15 smartphone um, and it worked much to the joy of our engineering team. They're thrilled to, to have it happen. Um, if we can go to the next slide, this is actually the one that I'm going to spend most of my time with because I think this is the most interesting. Um, and we're talking here about projects that we are underway of, of implementing or have already finalized. Um, and I'll, I'll take it from, um, from, from left to right. Um, we've worked uh, with the large donor um, and then with Grameen Foundation to implement a COVID-19 relief program. Um, and the program was focused especially at female-headed households. We're talking about 3,500 of them. Um, and it made use of a couple of features of digital currencies. And when I talk to these programs, what I would encourage you to think of is take digital currencies and think CBDC, right? Because everything that can be programmed for the projects that we've done, um, you can easily envision doing with, with a central bank digital currency and obviously more. Um, and so with blockchain, you have the possibility to program money. Um, and what we were able to do here is take the desire of, of the donor um, and really code the funds in a way that they could only be used on groceries and pharmaceuticals. The nice part about this is people received funds into their phone wallet um, and they went to the merchant, they spent it, but once the, mo the money reached the merchant's uh, wallet, they were free of conditions. And so that period of redeeming the funds from the program or going somewhere else and, and waiting for, for funds to come in 
uh, basically does not exist anymore. And at the same time, you have you ensure 100% compliance with uh, the rules of the program. One other thing that um, is going to come up again and again, and I think Bobby also mentioned, is the visibility that you now have for tracking funds disbursement. Um, we had out of um, the people that received funds two cases of attempted fraud, um, and the we were able to flag them immediately. Um, so within 30 minutes, we were able to go in, understand from what wallet to what wallet funds have went, um, and and identify where um, where that had happened. And um, that is is fantastic, both from from Grameen, who was supervising and trying to get more information of the money flows but also for the donor to see where the funds have been spent. And one thing that I do wanna mention on this is we worked with female heads of households who were sort of in the bottom, um, so we were, there wasn't the bottom 20% in terms of income, but they were in that uh, 20 to 40%. And so yes, they, um, you know, they were in the, the bottom of, of the population in terms of income, but they were barely literate, they had they had never um, downloaded an app on their phone. Um, and frequently they, they shared a smartphone uh, with the entire household. And even so we had a 98% ability to um, have them complete the onboarding and go through with the program. Um, everything was done remotely because this happened during COVID lockdowns. So we didn't have anybody on the ground who was implementing this. Um, and I know there are a lot of questions of it's blockchain too complicated for, for, um, for people who don't have access to bank accounts. And the answer is if you design the user interface, um, it isn't because they don't need to understand all of the, the technology in the, in the back. They only need to see that their money is coming in and understand how, how that's flowing, right? Um, the same way that they're able to use a smartphone, frankly, so am I without really understanding what all the electricity uh, the electrical systems that are that are powering it works. Um, I just know that it works. Um, the second one that I wanted to talk about um, goes to another group that I think it's, it's sort of really focal to the mission of, of AFI, and that is youth. Uh, we work with one of the big UN agencies and with um, one of the biggest platforms for micro work providers and AI training um, to develop a, a smartphone app that um, Basically, what it does is um, it's a blockchain based mobile micro work app that gives the ability to anyone with a phone to perform micro tasks. It's AI um, training, and that can be tagging a photo or transcribing information from a receipt. There's about 10 levels of intensity from the safety of their home, right? Um, and what it does, it, the, the app also integrates. Um, the current, the digital currency, which is pegged to the U.S. dollar, but it could be, you know, again, imagine that it is your your country's CBDC, that is the the Bahama Sand dollar, um, that people are able to receive immediately as funds. And why this is important is because for micro work, usually you have micro payments, right? And so you have somebody in Ethiopia, you have somebody in the Philippines, you have somebody in in Pakistan who is doing work from their phone. The tasks are, you know, they're, they're not very complicated. They're not going to make you Bill Gates, but they will provide those five to ten additional dollar per week or more if you do harder tasks that can help build resilience for the household, especially in cases where lockdown is happening or you're not able, you're in between jobs or your fruit stand um, isn't working because it's not the right season. Um, and so those small amounts of money, uh, we've been able, um, by testing with, with, in three countries, to see that we've been able to reduce up to 98% of the cost of transfer. Um, and then people were able to, um, to redeem it and, and use it. Um, I'm going to go to um, the last example, which is a traceability of funds prototype that we worked with on with the World Bank. and. Uh, for a lot more details, the World Bank will be publishing the report after that prototype by the end of the month. Um, basically, at the beginning of the year, the World Bank issued a statement of work asking for help to understand how um, blockchain can help with the tracing and traceability of funds disbursements. As you all know, once the World Bank is, uh, just um, transfers the funds, they have very little visibility into how it's being spent. And they're interesting to see 
can we track um, that the funds have arrived that, that um, you know, they're, they're reaching the intended user, um, that a loan that's for education isn't being, you know, spent on um, building a highway or, or similarly. Um, and the reason that I bring it up is because it shows the potential of blockchain in terms of tracking traceability and the visibility of what's happening with money. Um, the dashboard that we build with them, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's nothing special. We build it with them. Um, you can do it on a number of other blockchains just to be you know, fully transparent. It's just important what you want to get out of it. What it does, it's really ensures that this burst funds can only be used for expenses that have been pre-approved. Um, and that wallets that have engaged in suspicious activity shows up as flagged before the disbursement happens. And so the upstream entity in this case, be it you know, the agency of payments or, or say this is a loan for education, the Ministry of Education is able to retain payment until the situation is investigated. Um, and so it brings this type of information visibility um, really in, in real time. Um, and then concurrently, we are organizing um, a hackathon with UNODC, so the UN Office for Drugs and Crime in East Africa, um, to build um, solutions uh, in the anti-corruption on blockchain. Um, and then I wanted to end talking about the government stimulus vouchers, um, which again, it's taking advantage of the programmability of funds in the shape of conditional transfer vouchers. Um, this is something we started a conversation with um, two governments, but the closest that's um, about to start implementing is with a large city in the US. Um, and with the, the, the Federal Reserve Bureau that is um, who the city falls in, in its jurisdiction. And really what they're trying to test is a type of community currency, so a city coin that's pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the US dollar. Um, but what I wanna do is make sure that the stimulus is being spent, right? In times of crisis, a lot of people will save the money, will refrain from spending, which then double hits the economy um, because the money isn't flowing. And so with the implementation of demerage, um, so the fee for people not to spend money in the due time, um, they want to test how they can, though, in this way, incentivize people to spend in the local economy to have the funds flowing. And I think in addition to being really interesting, and uh, we're talking with the IMF, who's really interested in writing a study on how this works, um, I think it, it, it goes and shows um, really uh, the possibility of, of seeing real-time monetary policy happening. Um, great, I know we're going over time. I think very quickly on the penultimate, no, just keep going. One more, one more. Um, I know that you're gonna all receive the presentation. I, I know a very um, frequent question is how does an instant payment system compare with uh, CBDC? Um, and I think this would be um, something to help guide that conversation. I've tagged with C-Labs the ones that can only be, the, some of the features that are particular to solo blockchain. And then last but not least on the last website, I think it's a good question around thinking a CBDC as a tool to um, really mitigate the negative impact that bank risking has had on um, a number of countries system. Uh, but I will leave you with, with and, and how AML can be a lot more, more transparent um, utilizing blockchain. Uh, but I know you'll receive that, so I will stop talking. Thank you very much, Anka. And uh, as we expected, there's more interest and questions. So we're going to go straight into the Q&A session. And thank you to the panelists who have started answering some of the questions. Um, I'll start with uh, Professor Douglas Anna. And I think, Professor Douglas, um, one question came in that was asking about what's the best example or country we can get the experience on CBDC in terms of areas of regulations and governance? So it's a very general question, but who is the best example? Yeah, at this stage, we're, we're at a very early stage with these. Uh, the Bahamas uh, is one of the first, arguably the first country to actually uh, go live. Uh, there are others who may or may not have, but uh, it's something that um, each system 
uh, is unique. The increasing studies and some of the best studies, I think, are coming out of, uh, out of the BIS uh, and the IMF uh, in terms of comparative uh, analysis of what different pilots, different projects uh, are doing. Okay, thank you very much. And I think the caveat there is um, it's not a cookie cutter approach. You have to define your own context and sort of understand and design it to your own needs. And I think if I recall from your earlier conversation, um, Douglas, it was about understand the context, understand your own objectives. And I think in Bobby's case, so Bobby, I'm coming to you now because you alluded to the fact that financial inclusion was becoming a bigger challenge due to the storms and other external events like climate and you had to use that as an opportunity to um you use the sand dollar as an opportunity to bridge that gap as well being able to reach remote locations and there's many questions regarding the sand dollar especially around um interoperability ex you know um, exchange value the volume of sand dollars in circulation vis-a-vis -vis cash etc so can you just sort of give some ideas to how it works from that perspective Bobby, you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself, Bobby. Yes, correct. I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, yes, there are a lot of exogenous circumstances that, that, that prompted um, the creation of, of sand dollar versus uh, perhaps um, use cases in other, um, in other countries or in, in other jurisdictions. But primarily in the Bahamas, uh, sand dollar is a domestic payment rail. It is something that is only used domestically. So for visitors that are coming in, if they want to use sand dollars, they still have to go through the current um, foreign exchange channels to um, exchange to either the sand, the Bahamian currency, and then, uh, uh, you know, and also the sand dollar and vice versa. For Bahamians that need to go um, to other countries, they still have to go through the current proper um, foreign exchange channels, um, i.e. the commercial banks to obtain foreign currencies. But like I previously alluded to, um, I, I do believe that we will reach at a point in the future where in the future state, uh, where other countries and other jurisdictions explore CBDCs as, an, as a viable option, we will then implement some type of a global interoperable uh, payments rail through which all of the CS CBDCs can, can interoperate and exchange with one another uh, seamlessly. So that, that is something that I do firmly believe in. Um, and to your second part, uh, what, what was your second question? I'm sorry, Professor. In, in terms of the exchange value and the volumes of sand dollars versus bah um, Bahamian um, dollars. Um, so it, it's hard to, to really pinpoint on, on a percentage. Uh, I think it's still too early to tell, but we are going on a as needed basis. So we are, we are, um, uh, concurrently exchanging fiat for the need of sand dollars. So all of the financial institutions have um, the channel to, to request for sand dollar through which they can, they can do internally in the system securely. And then we in, in exchange will, will uh, issue them the, um, the commensurate amount of, of, C, of uh, sand dollar. So okay. it's on an Wait, as, basis, as, as needed basis at this time. Okay, and I think you also answered another question because someone asked if you were going directly to central, this um, customers were going directly to the central bank. So they go through commercial yep. banks in general. It's a two-tiered two process. Okay, great. And then Erica Williams is asking, when foreigners come in and live with balances on their wallets, what happens to that? So right now we are exploring a few different options. One of which is in person. Um, you can go to any of the over-the-counter um, uh, you know, any of the authorized financial institutions that have physical presence to exchange it back into fiat. Um, and secondly, we are also exploring uh, virtual machines uh, similar to ABMs and IT, uh, IBM, uh, uh, um, uh, ATMs um, that you can place strategically in, in the, the ports, ports of entry and ports of exit um, so that users can, can translate it into into a uh, into USD or, or, or Bahamian currency. So um, those are currently the options. And then also domestically, um, users are able to translate it into um, into a bank account. I mean, to into their um, 
commercial banks. So those are currently the three ways to withdraw from sand dollar. Okay, or you can just have your duty-free stores accept them so they can spend them out as they leave the country. Yes, that's, that's quite an incentive as well, yeah. We, we do anticipate that as well. Okay, great. Anka, I'm going to ask you a question from Nelly Arias Zavala. And she's asking, what is the support for the issuance of the digital currency? Central bank resources or depositors own funds? Does the latter require everyone to have savings accounts? Um, thank you for that. I think that really depends. Um, and I think this goes back to what uh, Professor Douglas mentioned is there is such a wide range of design decisions depending on what the central bank is looking to achieve with um, a CBDC uh, that really is, um, as central bankers think of it as you, you have a menu um, and, and you can sort of, um, it's, it's one of those build your own uh, story type of experience where you can decide um, what, what kind of, of features you want and how you want to, to have it done. And uh, I think in that way is, it, to me, it's, it's very easy to think back of mobile money and how much sort of um, resistance questions uh, were when, when that was, was um, started being uh, issued. And the only answer, the only way to answer these questions is by testing. Um, test a couple of designs that you have in mind in small controlled environments and see what works for you. Okay, great, thank you. So we're going back to this issue about you need to design it ahead of time before building it out. Raj, I'm going to ask you a general question about the platforms and going back to this issue about mobile money and CBDC technology, how do they differ and which, which should, how should commercial banks really make that rapid progression? If they haven't already, should they sort of leapfrog directly or should they start of going to the mobile money and e-payment space first? Look, whatever form of currency that a bank or a financial institution has, enabling a digital payment is an essential thing, CBDC or not. Um, and it has clear value prop uh, to make it accessible, um, whether that's through uh, contactless capable devices or QR code and other mechanisms so that should be done. In fact, um, those technologies and the standards that are evolving and, and already there in many parts of the world, uh, our point here really is that CBDC should take advantage of it instead of trying to kind of come up with new ways of doing it because it puts another barrier. Um, so digital currencies have already, especially after the pandemic, has really taken off. And, uh, and people have figured out how to conduct most of the businesses like that. Um, so that has been possible through standardization and you know, simply making this new form of the currency available through those standards uh, will simply you know, scale um, better, um, is what would be my um, high level point, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Bobby, um, Bobby, we're coming back to you on the sun dollar and I'm also going to get Professor Anna to chime in after you here. And the question is, what, what were some of the policies or guidelines developed to ensure that the sand dollar is accepted by commercial banks and customers? So in the adoption and onboarding, how did you incentivize or how did you get them to do that with the pilots? Yes, so we, we had a series of meetings with the, with the stakeholders, particularly um, commercial banks, as well as the uh, payment service providers and the money transfer businesses, all of which are supervised entities by the Central Bank of the Bahamas. Um, and they've all, all, all expressed a healthy appetite for mod more modernized payments infrastructure. Um, so they were um, the, the particularly the, um, the payment service providers and money transfer businesses were very keen on being the first movers in this space. They wanted to be nimble. They wanted to to be uh, innovative and avant-garde. So they were the first set to be onboarded um, as, as, um, as um, uh, wallet providers. Um, to your point about regulation, regulatory reform, uh, we had to revise our central bank bill as well as we are re recently in also uh, in the finalization stage of, of uh, legislating the um, Central Bank Act. 
um, to also include um, you know, CBDC and some of the usage uh, as well as the frameworks around uh, data protection, um, uh, cus customer protection, as well as uh, how miners should engage with uh, CBDCs as well. But um, sand dollar is legal tender uh, by definition. So it, it is something that is introduced as a, as a form of, of settlement of debt and it is liability of central banks. So it is something that's very safe and secured uh, from a policy perspective. And right now, um, the, a the, um, the payment service providers and the money transfer businesses already have existing clients that have an appetite for um, uh, a, a central bank digital currency through which they are now kind of pushing their own proprietary applications to be able to, to, to attract more users into this framework. So um, yeah, I think that it is right now being um, currently explored by all of the payment service providers. Okay, great. And why did you choose Exuma as the pilot, just out of curiosity? Um, because the, the, the physical configuration, it, it resembles a lot of the, the wider, uh, I guess, the, the wider geographic um, configuration of the country. It, it, has, it has many small islands and keys, very similar to how um, the Bahamas has the, the core in Nassau, which is the capital, and then tributaries all around. And then also uh, Exuma has a lot of uh, uh, tourist visiting as well, and, and also a healthy ecosystem of local vendors and local residents as well. So we felt that it, it would be a, a, almost like a microchasm of, of the wider configuration of the Bahamas. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that, Bobby. And Professor Anna, do you want to chime in on the legislative and policy side and regulatory side? Yeah, just a, a couple of quick points that I think Bobby has, has really hit it, but the starting point is from the central bank standpoint, making sure that really you have um, two sets of powers. One is in the context of the currency issuance. It's amazing how many central bank laws uh, basically are written in an analog way that uh, would restrict um, digital alternatives. And so that's one thing that you, you have to look at. Um, the second is really around payments. Uh, and it's something that, that I think is important, regardless of the, the CBDC context, I think the central bank should have an important role in supervising uh, the payment system. But it is something that I frequently see is lacking. Uh, and it's a, an issue from the standpoint, not only of CBDCs, but also of new alternative payment systems. So I think those two uh, are really key. And I think if we're looking at some of the issues, one is from the central bank side, from the commercial bank side, um, in some jurisdictions, we've had uh, some pushback. If you have uh, either, it doesn't necessarily mean, necessarily mean that uh, you don't have a functioning system. So for instance, China, uh, there's been a lot of back and forth between the WeChat Pay and Alipay and the central bank because they don't necessarily want their ecosystem, their dominance impacted. So they have a highly effective system and they want to keep it that way. Um, the central bank has some interest in providing interoperability, better data collection, uh, forcing opening from the standpoint of innovation, competition, et cetera. In other places, as you'll know, often the commercial banks make very high margins from the inefficiencies uh, in the payments and the current exchange system, uh, foreign exchange systems. And so they may push back. And so there will be often this jostling. And of course, from the standpoint of the public, um, I think really the key here, as Bobby has highlighted, is if we're talking about a central bank digital currency, it's a liability of the central bank. So it is by definition um, currency, it is legal tender uh, or a payment system that provides the same sort of functionality in terms of direct access to the central bank's balance sheet. And so I think an important understanding that this is exactly the same as other core elements of the monetary system from a legal standpoint. It is just a different technological system. But probably, I think one of the biggest issues is around the data protection and privacy. 
Uh, and this is something that uh, I think Anka's presentation on programmability highlighted some of these issues. And it's something that, you know, there are very good points and there are points where there can be real concerns. Uh, and certainly if we look at the design uh, of the Chinese system, one aspect is that no, data will not be available to other private sector participants, but it will be available to the government. That is very useful from the standpoint of tracking all sorts of things. There is an objective to get rid of cash and replace it with uh, a digital system. At the other side, mm -hmm. if we want to take Canada's example, uh, it's been very clear from the, the Central Bank of Canada that they have stated that one of the advantages is in the context of policing crime, financial crime, tax evasion. And so it's almost a certainty that there will be some sort of access. And I think it's very important to have proper gateways built into that system for how information can be accessed uh, in a legally appropriate manner in order to build trust and confidence. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. And I'm going to end with um, asking our panelists for final comments, but I want the final comments to focus on reg the regulators, especially emerging market regulators, and what are the key competencies and capabilities they need to think about because Persona just brought out the fact that oh data protection but that's also outside of the central banking um, authority and jurisdiction depending on the country GDPR or other data protection law so how do we build institutions that work for everybody and ensure that there's that stability and integrity in the financial system so I'll start with Anka in terms of closing remarks and competencies for emerging market um, financial regulators. Oof, that's a tough question. I wouldn't dream to tell central banks what to do. Um, but I think there are, I think the first thing is, you know, education about whatever technology you may choose to adopt. And, and we've seen in the past with mobile money or with agent banking, central banks allowing tests as they were designing regulation in order to be able to inform regulation because you can't regulate something you don't know how it may work. Um, and I think that's that's really fundamental. Um, and I think ultimately you're, uh, you know, the ability to develop a data analytics and technological team inside the, the, the central bank, who's able to um, bring in a lot of the data that's being generated by digital payments and, and generate lifetime monetary policy suggestion and insights to be able to really improve the velocity with which the central bank is acting on the data they receive um, is something that's going to become uh, fundamental. Um, but then it's, you know, test. That's the only way you're, you know, we're, we're learning how to how to do this. Okay, great. Thank you, Anka. And Raj, any comments from you in terms of what competencies should our emerging market central bankers be building and thinking about? Yeah, sure. A um, uh, couple of two quick points. Uh, the first thing that I would um, I would encourage all of us to think about is step away. Uh, I know this is a topic about central bank digital currencies, but it is always looked good to look at in the larger market context. Where are you in the payment system journey of your country? Where are you in the digitization of payments in general? And think about um, central bank digital currencies in that context to see whether it is adding to um, uh, the cost of the infrastructure or it's helping. Um, can you think in the context of how the rest of the upgrades for the payment systems are done in the country and whether CBDC makes sense in that context? And it is important for achieving the broader objectives, I think. The second, um, I, I, I talked about this earlier, is think from a consumer and a business perspective. Um, we can't achieve whatever the policy objectives that you have without having a simple usable um, uh, product um, in, the, in, the, in the hands of consumers and businesses and other stakeholders. That would be my two highlights and, uh, and, and I'll stop there. Okay, great. Thank you, Raj. Professor Anna, your highlights? Thanks, Aliyah. I think for me, the, the, the key is really three, an understanding of the context, which the central bank should have. The second, really bringing up Anka's point again, is an understanding of the technologies. 
Um, this is something that there are so many different options available that I think it's very important that central banks increasingly understand these. And finally, in particular, competence in the context of cybersecurity issues, the risks that go with digital systems. And I think all three of these things are things that are hugely important beyond just the CBDC context, beyond just the financial inclusion context, uh, and really go to, to general roles in the financial sector. Great. Thank you very much, Rasan. And Bobby, I'm ending with you since you're sitting in it, so you can give us real life examples and advice. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, and I, I think Anka, Professor Douglas and Raj did such a tremendous job anchoring the points that I, I wanted to make. I'm going to keep this closing remark very high level. I think beyond the education and some of the technical competencies is to, for other regulators to think outside the box and to genuinely be um, curious of the world around us. And I think that's, that's, that's a foster ground for true innovation. And digital innovation doesn't have to be a zero sum game. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the participants uh, within the ecosystem think that they're gonna be pegging against each other and, and going against each other out of, out of um, being able to arbitrage, as Doug, um, Professor Douglas alluded to, um, an inefficient market. A lot, of, a lot of stakeholders are captivating on this arbitrage of, an, uh, of a generally inefficient market. But it doesn't have to be that way. You know, I think gen uh, digital innovation can create uh, what, what I call is, um, this, uh, this is a dash that says, rising tides floats all boats, floats all vessels, right? And if we bring in the, more, the, the, the appetite and the general um, inqui inquisitiveness of using CBDCs, I think it's going to broaden the scope, broaden the economy a lot, and also generally help um, those individuals that are underbanked or unbanked um, to, 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 to promote greater financial inclusion overall for the economy, especially in times like these. So that's what I'm going to kind of close with a, a more general remark. Thank you very much, everyone. And I think um, from the, by the looks of things, we can stay here for another two hours and not run out of topics to, talk, um, to speak about. But I, I'll go back to just winding it down. Yes, we started out talking about CBDCs, but I think the bigger picture is we're in this digital revolution like Prasanna started us off with and CBDCs are part of it. And we need to sort of put everything within context, like Raj said, where are we in our payment systems journey? Let's not just uh, take a knee jerk reaction to bring in this in because Bahamas have done it, but let's really think back, settle down and really realize what do we want to achieve with it? Where are we going with it? And then let's start educating ourselves. And I think the education really spans across um, the different digital technologies that we see today. You know, when Anka talked about data, this is really about smart regulation and how do we start thinking about being more proactive and more of a data boros kind of central bank. And then when we talk about the mindset changes that we also need to go through, because it's really very different for, in terms of what we're used to, especially from a supervision lens. How do we engage with our financial market actors? How do we interact with them? What, you know, how do we regulate them in this new world? What will regulation look like? And I think these are questions that we need to ask, whether in the CBDC context or even just in this whole digital era that, we've, um, that we're living in, because the COVID-19 pandemic is an opportunity that we can also catalyze on and sort of continue to ride the storms as we see them and bring more people on board in whatever evolution our payment systems can gather. So ladies and gentlemen, Anka, Professor Douglas, Bobby and Raj, I want to say a big thank you and I'll hand back over to Yemi. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, AFI members, you've been fantastic. Thank you for the questions and have a good day. Thank you so much, Professor Inka. Thank you so much to our esteemed speakers. Uh, and again, a, thank, a big thank you to all the participants uh, for, for the wonderful questions. Uh, we really, truly appreciate them. And I'm sure you found the discussions very exciting as I did. Um, a quick acknowledgement, uh, we do recognize that we have quite a number of questions unanswered. Uh, we apologize for this, but as you know, uh, we have to manage the time. But we do encourage everyone to all our participants, please send in your questions to us. Uh, you can send it to the DFS working group at afi-global.org email or to any of the working group managers that you know. 
and we would have uh, our speakers uh, respond to you as quickly as possible. Again, we thank you for your contributions. We thank you for the questions. Uh, please send them to us if you still need clarity on any, and we would make sure the speakers get back to you with good responses. Again, we've had a lot of deliberations today. I will not go back highlighting the points you've learned or that have been emphasized, but I would like to take a second pause of the room to find out if anything has changed uh, compared to what uh, your initial perception to the topic. Uh, so we'll run a quick poll uh, just to see uh, what has changed in, in our thinking, in, in our mindset, and again, what recommendations do you have for us to take forward? Uh, can we have the poll now? So we have five questions uh, for this poll. Uh, we'll run it for about two minutes. Uh, so I encourage you to please uh, select the appropriate answer. So as we did uh, at the beginning of the webinar, we did ask uh, what, should your cent what should your central bank or institution consider as uh, or pursue opportunities related to CBDC. Uh, the second question is asking if you believe based on everything you've heard that CBDC would accelerate financial inclusion in your country. Uh, the third one is asking uh, from the insights from this webinar, uh, do you see any opportunities for CBDC in your, in your country? Uh, the fourth one, same way, uh, from what you've learned so far from the examples shared, do you see any potential risk uh, for issuing or pursuing CBDC in your respective countries? And, and the, uh, the fifth one is basically, uh, this is just the start of the conversation as Norbert mentioned earlier. Uh, so taking this forward, uh, what recommendations do you have for the DFS working group uh, as they explore this uh, important topic further? Uh, we would appreciate your answers. Uh, so we have about 40 more seconds. So we, we begin to see a big change uh, compared to earlier in the day. Uh, now we are having upwards almost 90% of participants uh, saying that they would consider uh, the potential opportunities in errant in CBDCs. Uh, many more are also agreeing that CBDCs might accelerate inclusion in their respective countries, uh, which is quite a significant change. And again, we begin to see uh, the multiple choice questions are saying, uh, indeed, uh, they see opportunities. Uh, to promote payment, uh, to accelerate inclusion. Uh, many are also seeing this as an opportunity to, for the rural communities and the vulnerable segments of society. Uh, and again, that's quite, quite important. Uh, for the potential risk, uh, we begin to see that literacy is quite ranking quite high. Uh, again, the capabilities and the readiness of the regulator is quite high. Uh, as, as expected, cybersecurity is also ranked quite high. Uh, can we hand the polling now so we have a clear view of what members are saying? So clearly we, we can see that there's been a change uh, in, in opinions uh, since the start, which, which is quite interesting. Uh, as we all know, uh, so it, quite a number of us are agreeing that indeed uh, the opportunities uh, within CBDC, and you're indicating that you might want to consider and take this forward. Uh, many more, about 70% of the room is also agreeing that there might be opportunities to, to actually use CBDCs to deepen inclusion, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, for the opportunities, I think it's, it's quite clear, uh, payments ranked quite high, uh, followed by inclusion, and, and we see uh, managing and reducing AML CFT issues is also quite high. Uh, this, these are important points and we do note them. Uh, for the risk, uh, we, we highlight cybersecurity is still considered the biggest risk. Uh, a lot of us think uh, is inherent in, in the use of this technology. And we see quite clearly also the capacity and the readiness of the regulator to take this forward is also one of the potential risks highlighted. Uh, so in support of this, taking this forward, uh, many are asking that we have more capacity building and training. So speakers, that's a challenge to you all. You have more speaking and talking to do. Uh, again, uh, again, we are looking at doing more research work, uh, in-depth analysis, and, and coming up probably with a special report has also been highlighted. We do recognize and appreciate this feedback. Thank you so much for this. So we will stop sharing.
uh, the poll results. And uh, in, in the next one minute, I would like to request uh, members, please, uh, in just a minute or so, uh, we would like to hear your feedback uh, regarding the conversations we've had today. So in terms of the format, in terms of the choice of speakers, in terms of the objectives, have we met that objective? Have we clearly uh, at least conveyed to you the understanding of CBDCs, uh, what the motivation is about, um, what implications it has for, regu for, for, for regulations, and again, what, what specific relevance does it have for financial inclusion? So to give us this feedback within a minute or two, kindly scan the QR code on the screen or use the link below to access the, the feedback. So in just two minutes, please. So the, the survey basically has five simple questions. So they're just tick, 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 and I will be done. We appreciate your, your, your help with this. Thank you so very much. Uh, so while we complete the slides, I would like to invite uh, the chair of the DFS Working Group, uh, Assistant Sub-Governor from the Central Bank of Egypt, uh, Mr. Hehab, uh, to give the closing remarks. Uh, Hehab, the floor Thank is you. Yours. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, it was really um, uh, uh, great to discuss this uh, very important topic today. And it was really, I do believe we all we're very interested to hear about the sun dollar uh, experiments that's being done in Bahamas. And I do believe that we are all eager to know the results of this uh, after launching it. Yani, I do believe the next time we'll be all eager to know the lessons learned from this important um, uh, exercise. So uh, Bobby, we are uh, all depending on you next time to tell us what has happened. However, it's clear um, uh, that one of the main takeaways that we as regulators have to uh, work very uh, hard on this topic, taking into consideration there is no one uh, solution fitting all. So uh, every, uh, every one of us has to work on his uh, environment to customize whatever regulations uh, to facilitate uh, if needed uh, launching of uh, such a CBDC uh, inside his uh, country. So uh, um, uh, it, it's really interesting and there is a lot of uh, pressure on us as regulators to uh, work hard on uh, this. I, as uh, as Olyanka has said, we can extend the whole day talking about this topic. It's very interesting and there is a lot of open uh, ended uh, discussions and a lot of debates in this uh, area that we can uh, discuss uh, the whole day, so um, um, uh, it's, 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 it's not easy to, I am very sad to end this uh, webinar after only two hours. I do believe next time we have to to, uh, to extend this to might be three or four hours in order to finish all the questions. I can see the queues for uh, the Q&As are too long. However, Yani, I, I really encourage our colleagues to send all their uh, questions to, the, uh, to our email so that we can reply uh, back to them. So uh, I really, uh, at the end, need to thank every one of you, uh, uh, Professor uh, Douglas, uh, Anka, Bobby, for being, uh, uh, and Raj for being with us today. That was uh, really kind of you. Uh, also, Olyanka, you, as, uh, as usual, moderated this in a very uh, professional uh, way. Uh, Giaz, Adayimi, and all the AFI team, uh, thank you for preparing such uh, an important webinar. Uh, thank you all and have a great day. Back to you, Adayimi. Thank you so much, uh, Ahab. And on that note, everyone, I would like to say have a wonderful morning, a wonderful afternoon, and a wonderful evening. And again, as a reminder, please send in your questions. We would be very happy to respond to them. And any comments or feedback you might have, please share them as well. Any ideas of what you want us to discuss as well, do share as well. And for now, we'll say a big thank you and goodbye.